Hello everyone. Today's lecture is going to be about economic growth and the mechanisms through which poorer countries may or may not be able to reach the levels of economic development of countries at the frontier. We will try to understand which factors cause some countries to grow fast and others to grow slow over large periods of time, such as between 1950 and 2010, and why these East Asian countries fared so much better than Sub-Saharan countries, for example. We will also look into the possible reasons why rich countries, such as the US, tend to exhibit relatively stable GDP growth rates, and most importantly, what can policymakers do to promote GDP growth. But before that, it is good to first have a direct view of what all these economic disparities mean in concrete terms. We need to humanize all these GDP per capita to see how people that live with about $50 a month compare with families in developed economies with incomes that are two order of magnitude larger. Let's start with the Butoy family. They live in Burundi, a country where GDP per capita in purchasing power parity precisely amounts to $55 a month. They live in the province of Makamba. Imelda, the matriarch, is 41 years old and works in her farm. She has four children. Three of them live with her, Patrick, who is 13, Eric, with seven, and Landry, just four years old. Her daughter Chantal is nine, but lives with an uncle very far away. Imelda works about 60 hours a week, on top of which she spends 40 minutes every time she needs to collect water and 14 hours per week to gather wood. They built their own house and have lived there for about five years. There are two rooms, essentially a bedroom and a kitchen. They don't have a toilet and the house is made of wood, mud and straw. The family spends about 80% of their budget just on food. They don't save any money and they don't have any plans to buy anything worthy of note, but hope that one day they will be able to fulfill their dream of buying a bigger house. Their most favorite items are their cattle and clothes. Here, we can see them sitting where they usually eat their meals. The kids' favorite toys are their school textbooks. Going around 10 times up in the income scale to $661 per month, we go to the Philippines to meet the Gakotera family. They live in Tacloban. Leo, the father, is 40 years old, works in a farm. His wife, Maria, is 36 years old, and they live with their three sons, Gon, 12 years old, and Carlo, 9 years old, who are both students, and Julian, 5 months old. Leo works for a total of 48 hours a week. He sometimes gets an additional 20 hours working as a lumberjack. The Gakotera family lives in a two-room house, which they own, and was built with the help of family and friends. They have been living there for the past 40 years. The house has electricity, which fails several times a week, and a toilet. The kitchen has limited utensils and is no bigger than the average size bathroom in the US. The family buys 50% of their food, which costs them about 50% of their income, and produces the rest themselves. They use electricity and wood for cooking. Leo and the children spend two hours a week collecting wood. The parents spend 21 hours a week attending to home agricultural activities and Maria spends an extra 21 hours a week doing housework. The Gakotera family does save some money and sometimes go on vacation. The furthest they have ever been was to Manila. The next big thing they plan to spend money on is constructing a new roof for the house. They hope that one day they will be able to fulfill their dream of buying a big house. Another big dream the family has is that one day they will be able to buy a big house and not worry about leaky roofs. We now move to Brazil, in the south, to one of the richest states in the country, Santa Catarina. Income now is about twice as much as in the Philippines, to about $1,190 per month. Meet the Ilgen Stiller family. Selina is 37 years old and works in sales. Her husband Victor is 28 and is a mechanic. They have four-year-old daughter, Elena, and she is in school. Together, Victor and Shalina work around 88 hours per week. The family owns and lives in a three-bedroom house. They have been living in the house for one year and like its spacious accommodations and location, which is in an area they grew up. It has uninterrupted electricity, an in-house water supply, and indoor toilet facility. 
The family purchases all their food supplies and spends around 40% of their income on it. They buy toys and dolls for Elena. For cooking, they use LPG fuel and drinking water is available inside their house. The Ilgenstiegel family is hardly saving any money. However, their next big plan is to start their own car workshop. Their dream is to one day buy their own brand new car. The family has also never had a vacation and hope they can save enough money and take their daughter to Disney World. Lastly, we move to Sweden, more precisely to Uppsala, to meet the Vestibecken family. Swedish monthly GDP per capita in 2018 was $3,933. Jonas is 35 years old and is a technical product manager. His wife Tove is 38 years old and she works as a project manager. They live with their two sons, Arvid, six years old, who's a student, and Gunnar, four years old. Together, the couple works for about 80 hours a week. The Vestibecken family lives in a four-bedroom house that they own. They've been living there for the past five and a half years. They chose to live outside of Uppsala because it's close to the countryside, but it's still within biking distance to the city and is more affordable. They like living close to a forest with all its animals, but they find the highway and railway noisy. The house has reliable electricity, safe running water and a toilet. The family buys about 90% of its food, which costs them about 30% of their income, and produce the remaining 10% themselves. They use electricity for cooking in the kitchen. In addition to the time they spend at work, Jonas and Tove spend an extra 20 hours every week doing housework. Drinking water costs them less than 10% of their income. They are able to save money and sometimes go on vacation. The furthest that they have ever been was to Sydney in Australia. The next thing they plan to buy is a new car and they dream of buying a digital camera. Their favorite item is their photo album. The family also spends a small amount of their savings to provide books, toys and other entertainment resources for their children, since they consider it important for their development. Notice that as income grows, households tend to work less hours, spend proportionally less of their budget in essential goods and have much better living conditions. This is further evidence for the relationship between GDP per capita as a proxy for welfare. Even their dreams and aspirations are strongly conditioned by the context in which they live. If you recall, we focused on technological progress leading to innovations in explaining increases in living standards through time. However, all of these families live in the same interconnected world, in the same technological era. It's not like Burundi has yet to invent internet or cloud computing in order to achieve Sweden's level of economic well-being. There must be other mechanisms through which these differences exist. We will address those in the context of the solo model.